There seems to be less money all the time for ecology. In addition, questions that require doing studies across a lot of different locations. Um, the Nutrient Network uh, has, has tackled this problem by getting a relatively small grant and organizing research across lots of different sites. Uh, I caught up with Eric Lind, uh, postdoc working on the project recently, to talk about you. Can you please uh, briefly introduce yourself and your role in NewtNet and how you got involved? Sure. Well, yeah, I'm Eric Lind, and uh, I'm the postdoc on the project. It's called the Nutrient Network. And I got involved uh, about two years ago now. I was hired on as a postdoc, the second postdoc, actually, for this project. And uh, so um, my role is to kind of uh, coordinate the network in terms of especially data management, but also uh, communication among all the participants. Can you provide a brief uh, history of NewtNet? Sure. Well, this this project got started in 2006, actually, at an NCS working group where they're looking at effects of uh, resources and consumers on different types of communities. And um, this is a group uh, that Elizabeth Bohr and Eric C. Bloom were involved in with some other folks, but they um, basically were frustrated with the meta analyses that they were doing because there were so few terrestrial uh, examples of of the manipulations that they wanted to analyze. And so what they came up with was the idea of, well, we know some people that are interested in this and we could do kind of a small side experiment in six, seven places and then kind of analyze it as a single experiment. And so it was born out of that frustration of meta-analysis comparing different methodologies and things like that. They decided, well, we'll just do the experiment the same way everywhere we can and see what we get. So that, that was the idea, um, originally fewer than 10 sites and sort of as they spread the word about what they wanted to do, it kind of blew up and in a, you know, by 2008 there were 30 to 40 sites and then now we're up to, in 2012, we're up to 65 sites that are participating in the network in some way, some ex experimental, mostly experimental, but some also just observational data. And so the, uh, yeah, go ahead. So it didn't start with the, because you guys got an NSF grant to sort of pay for some of the work, and so it didn't start with the NSF grant. No, it started as, um, and, I, and I should clarify, the NSF grant is for the coordination, so it pays for me as a postdoc, and it pays for us to have meetings. But it doesn't actually pay for any of the work or the um, investment in the, the field, you know, equipment and things like that. So. Um, so yeah, so it started as this idea that they had people who were interested in the question and could kind of put it in a low-cost basis and then work together to analyze it, which is still the model we're following. So can you share some um, stats on NewtNet, you know, stuff like how many, well, you just shared, I think, a number of stats, but any more number of publications, I don't know, database size or whatever, whatever you think is relevant. Right. I mean, we have uh, so 65 sites. We have uh, they're all based around five meter by five meter plots. In uh, I should say, this is all grasslands, herbaceous vegetation, many different types, from old fields to savanna to you know um, uh, alpine grasslands, meadows. We've got uh, 15 different countries, six continents. Um, at the LTER meeting recently, we heard that they're you know, might be a chance that somebody in Ar Antarctica wants to put a uh, nut net experiment down at Palmer. We'll see if that happens or not. But they do have grass, evidently. But uh, other than that, yeah, so we're, you know, we're distributed pretty widely. We're like most global experiments. We're concentrated in the U.S., Europe, Australia for most of our representation. But um, so, yeah, we've got 2,100 or so individual plots. And all of those have data on percent cover of, by plant species, biomass, um, many of them have soil data, uh, light, photosynthetic, active uh, radiation. Um, and as far as the scope of the sort of plant taxonomy, we figured out that we're at about uh, 1,800 species or taxa right now uh, worldwide, which if you round up is about 1% of the vascular flora, so we feel like that's a pretty good number to be hitting. So. Um, yeah, and then our, our database is uh, is uh, still growing because we've gotten up to five years of data from 
a bunch of these sites at this point. So, yeah, it's a big it's a big resource. Um, as far as publications, we have three essentially out right now. We've got about five that are either in submission, review, circulating, full drafts, and probably about twenty that are in active development um, as far as manuscripts go. So, what are some of the focal um, NewtNet research questions? Uh, you, you talked about sort of some of the motivation for for starting it, frustration with meta analysis. But like, if, if you were going to say like, oh, this is the questions that motivate the work, what what would they be? Right. Well, there's there are actually three that are kind of built into the project. The first one is to look at uh, diversity and productivity relationships, which is an old question in ecology, like do more productive systems, uh, you know, generate more diversity? Is it only up to a point? Uh, the traditional sort of model was this hump-shaped uh, curve where it's sort of like the, the, the middle of the productivity spectrum generates the most diversity. And that was a real general question that, that people wanted to tackle. And that was the first sort of highest profile paper that NutNet has had so far, Adler et al. in uh, Science in 2011. And uh, essentially, they, they attacked this question and said, based on our widespread geographic replication, there's not a general shape to that curve. It, it varies from place to place. And that's true both at local and regional scales. So that's the first question, diversity productivity. And then the second two are the ones we're answering with experiments. One is, um, do multiple, do most um, grassland communities, are they limited by multiple nutrients, are they co-limited or are they sort of um, just limited by nitrogen for instance. And so to answer that we're using factorial additions of nitrogen, phosphorus and then a bunch of other nutrients mostly uh, we call it the potassium plus kind of treatment. Um, so that's one thing. And then the final question is whether plant communities are sort of controlled by resources bottom up or consumers top down. And so the, the final experiment is crossing nutrient addition with uh, vertebrate fencing. And so all of this is kind of contained in a, a replicate block of 10 plots. And so there is the whole nutrient treatment and the nutrient by fence treatment together in one block. And then most sites have three blocks. Um, so it's, it's all in all a very low footprint for any one site. It's about, you know, 1,000 square meters or so at the vector. So it, it's the replication, the power, the inference we get is all from the distribution of these sites around the world. So you have a large number of uh, participants in, in NewtNet. Uh, how do you manage uh, the data and so there's one, the data, and then two, the authorship uh, for such a large group? Uh, as far as the data, that was the first thing I um, sort of tackled. I came on right as the project seemed to be ramping up quite a bit in terms of data flowing in. Um, it was in the, about the third year of the experiment, so um, we were adding sites and a lot of data was coming in. So what I did was develop a relational database um, in MySQL uh, to handle this data and split it out into different tables, but that then can be sort of transparent to users too, so they can they don't have to deal with the database part. That's sort of like my job. Um, and there are models for doing that. I didn't invent anything necessarily for that. Um, so I feel like the data process is actually, is actually um, pretty stable at this point. The authorship one is a really interesting question because, um, as I was saying, this is kind of like everybody's side project. Um, but at the same time, this wouldn't really exist and none of the manuscripts are working on what exist without all the people doing their part. And so the question of, you know, significant contribution, for instance, that would establish authorship is, is a little bit different. So we're handling that a couple different ways. One is that uh, we have what we call opt-out papers, meaning if you uh, implement the experiment and contribute your data, you know, I think for five years was the, was the idea, um, you'll be an author on two or three core papers that are the main results of the project. For instance, the multiple nutrient limitation paper or the top-down, bottom-up paper, which is, uh, which is in uh, development at this point. And so just by doing the experiment, you're an author on these papers. But for most of the other papers that are going to be coming out, um, it's what we call opt-in, 
And the idea there is uh, data contribution is just the first step. It gets you in the door. From then on, you have to contribute in other more traditional ways, developing analysis, writing, what have you, to be an author. And so the authorship lists are going to be maybe longer than traditional you know, single-site studies, uh, but they shouldn't all be you know, 70 authors, for instance. Um, and then we have uh, a you know, sort of grandiose name for it is the authorship committee, but we have a couple people who are not sort of in the headquarters here who are tasked with kind of resolving disputes if those come up. They haven't really yet. But we have people that are sort of uh, making sure that um, manuscripts and development are not overlapping too much, that people feel like they're getting a fair shake, either getting added to or taken off papers, whatever it is. Um, so we're trying to kind of feel our way through that process. But it's really a, it's really a, something we're developing still. Um, we're trying to learn from other big projects. There's an experiment in Germany called the Jena Biodiversity Experiment, which is a um, huge multi-collaborator experiment. Um, and they have a lot of different processes for acquiring data and sort of more rigorous and formal than we want to use. But there are some things we've been learning from them about just sort of uh, communication about what data you plan to use and how and then uh, whether people can contribute to a project. So, oh, one more thing, just I should mention that so for all the papers that NutNet is putting out, we're attaching as an appendix a, an authorship rubric. It's a matrix, you know, it's just authors and then the maybe five or six columns for the types of contributions that they made. And so this will be on every NutNet paper, so you will be able to evaluate actually what people did, uh, what pieces they did contribute. So there's you know, decreasing funding for science, you know, budgets seem to be being slashed for NIH and NSF and, and all the other agencies. Um, so this, this sort of low-cost distributed research network seems, seems like a pretty interesting and promising model. Um, do you think, have you heard of others that have copied, copied your model or others, you know, at least talking about it? Yeah, there are, there are a few others. Um, other networks, some that some that exist, other RCN projects. One in particular called the Gleon or the Great Lakes Ecological Observatory Network. That's one that um, was nearly simultaneous to NutNet and uses a totally different model because it's an observational network. But they have a very similar sort of distributed structure and and cost structure. Um, there is a project called the Zostra Ecology Network or Zen, um, which is uh, one that is more or less uh, an aquatic version of Nutrient Network. They're doing fertilization and, and fencing out crustaceans in, uh, in near shore seagrass beds. And then uh, I know of one that's in development um, that people are trying to get off the ground dealing with uh, rainfall manipulation in grasslands around the world. So I think this, yeah, this model we hope is, is something that people will do. And I think whenever we talk about it, um, Try to make the point that um, you know this is a, this is definitely a generic thing that you can apply to whatever the question is that you're interested in. You know, if there if there is a question that would benefit from geographic replication rather than single site intense study, uh, and you can kind of come up with a, a you know a relatively easy way to manipulate it, this is this is a good model to follow. And we are we're hoping to sort of impart some of the things we've learned in the process as well. So that'll be a challenge, but as far as the science, I think uh, most of that should be able to, to continue.